If you had the opportunity to read through the biographies of our panelists on the back of the brochure, you'll see that we've assembled a group infinitely qualified to speak on the issue of gun violence as we search for ways in which we can work for individual and collective action. Won't you join me in welcoming our panelists as they take their seats on the stage? Essence Crystal, 
who was murdered in November 2011. Um, Diana, I, I remember sitting in your living room shortly after your daughter was killed, and you were looking at her photos, and you were talking about her in the present tense, and it was still new for you. And you know, I, I was wondering, what would you want people to know who have not been in your shoes about that experience? We're getting a little bit better intelligence on 
what is, is, is happening in the street. Um, we typically, we, where we, a lot of times these incidents in these communities, our relationship is tense. Um, that there's a historical component to that, there is a you know, socioeconomic component to that, but we're not always, always as uh, respected in the community as uh, we would want to think we are. You know, that's being honest. We, we, we don't have the credibility in some of the communities that um, I wish we, that, that we need to have. That has improved in my time in the police department. It's nowhere near where it needs to be. But that is, I, I, I have seen an improvement in my time in the police department along with some technological, technological advancements that are able, better able for us to be more precise in how we you know, exert our resources. So basically, we can understand conflicts and what is going on better in real time in order to act on it a little bit better. So, so the good thing is the technology has improved. The gun crime lab can match bullets to weapons. But the downside, the other side of the question I was going to ask you is what are the obstacles? It sounds like relationships still or trust with the community. Definitely. And, and, that, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge disconnect generation because the, these, these problems and these divisions are generational. Mm -hmm. So that they're, they're we're talking decades in the making. They're not going to be fixed in a day or a week. It takes time, it takes inroads, it takes effort on our part. We cannot be saying, hey, this isn't us, we have body camera, we're doing this, we're doing this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Historically, you're talking about someone who, if something happened to you when you were 15 years old, mm -hmm. you had a bad interaction, if you're 35, that's 20 years. You know, they, they, you don't care about that. You don't care about the new cop who's got the body camera on. It doesn't matter to you. So when these incidents happen, you know, we, we, we sometimes, we, we sometimes, not all the time, we run into a lack of cooperation in these communities. So that makes investigating these, these crimes difficult. So we end up sort of in this predicament where there's people who have committed these heinous crimes walking around with impunity because the, the, the community doesn't, we, we, we don't have the credibility that the community wants to help us. So the, these crimes, we, we can't really be as effective as we want to be. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that, that leads me to Lisa, uh, Lisa Pino Warren. She's the director of intervention services at the Nonviolence Institute. And they've been a huge, um, he, they've had a huge impact for the last 20 years, especially in Providence and now other communities and keeping the peace, but also really helping victims. And, you know, because I think it was recognized that law enforcement can only go so far. And that's where the Nonviolence Institute has stepped in. So, you know, I wanted to ask you, Lisa, you grew up in South Providence. And sometimes you personally know the families who whose loved ones are victims. So, what do you hear when you listen to what Sergeant McCann has to say? What are you hearing from the community? What is the impact on, on gun violence in your community? Um, well, to touch upon uh, the statement that he made in regards to trust, I mean, he, that is accurate. There is definitely um, a division, and there's definitely trust issues. Um, growing up in South Providence, once upon a time, I was one of those people that didn't trust police as well. I mean, but uh, it's generational. It's, as he said, socioeconomical. There are so many reasons why there's trust, and, and things have happened that caused, you know, the trust to break down the system. Um, and that's why we try to do a, as far as hiring for the organization, try to make sure it's people from the community that have experienced it. Many of our staff are young men and women who have um, some type of colorful past um, from the community. They may have been involved uh, with the law in the past. Um, 
They may have been a shooting victim. They may have shot at someone, but they're at a place in their lives that they want to change, make an impact. Um, I think that we've come a long way in building trust with the police department, specifically Providence Police Department. Um, I'm not going to say that the relationship is perfect, but over the 20 years, the relationship has really strengthened where um, I have, the 13 years that I've been with the Institute, I have seen um, where I have allies um, in the police department, where when I have a victim, when I have a family, or even when I have a young person that's involved in the violence, um, where I have people that I can reach out to and kind of be the, um, the liaison mm -hmm. to uh, assist a family. Because even victims sometimes don't feel comfortable speaking to police. Yeah. Um, so having liaisons, having those people that can speak for the community. I mean, we are still part of the community, but being more trusting of working with the police. You know, I'm also interested in how you talk to a young person who may be carrying a gun and may be thinking about retaliation, because you can have a conversation that maybe nobody else can have. What do you say? Are you going to beat this up? <laughs> I, I, we're all adults here. <laughs> um, well, to be honest with you, it's just, um, you know, tell, speaking the truth, the reality, and that's why we are who we are and we do the work because we've lived the life and we've experienced it. So being able to say to a youth, you know, I didn't read this in a book, you know, many of them already have respect for us because they know who we are and where we come from and um, our history. So they're a little bit more open to listening to us. We're examples of how you can turn your life around. Um, some of my staff is here in the audience. I won't point them out or anything. But some of my guys are here tonight. And um, you know, some of them have been incarcerated. Some of them have carried guns in the past. Many times, our young men and women now, um, they're not, it's not that they're bad people, but they are, because of what was mentioned, the generational beefs, they're born into this. So many young people feel as if they have to carry a gun for safety. I mean, I, I know a young man who was on a roll majority of his uh, you know, educational life and as an 11th grader was arrested with a gun. And I couldn't believe it and I asked him, you know, what, why, why are you carrying this gun? Well, because they shot my cousin and, and I heard that I was next. So mm -hmm. this is real life. You know, not every young person is a bad person that's in, involved, you know, carry gun, but that's where it comes to now the fact that there are too many guns in, in our community, and we gotta look at how did they get into our community, mm -hmm. and what we can do about that, and how can we get them out. Um, there's a lot of work to do, and there's so many layers, but um, as far as those conversations, they're real conversations, and they're probably a lot of cuss words, and, I have grabbed a couple of kids by their shirts and you know, so you know, and, you know, I'm also a parent. You know what I mean? So the same thing I would do with my child is the same way I'm gonna to speak to the young people in my community. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you brought up the layers because I really want to bring in um, our state representative uh, Marcia Ringman Vassal here beside me. She's a teacher. And um, this year she um, had the, the governor signed the Trauma Informed Schools Act. So we want to talk about that, but really introduced her. The fight against gun violence, she told me, is very personal. Um, one of her son's friends was Kip Stewart Jr. He was a basketball player, a good kid, and he was killed. And you had a lot of other students who died as well. So it, to get to where you passed, you got this legislation passed, I want to know what you see, the impact of gun violence on your own students. I didn't get a chance to meet Maya. I wish I did. But I honor her tonight. I also honor my own students, Tyson, Eric, Danny, Kip, Todd, Omar. These were my students. I taught them. They were in my classroom. They were asking me for Jolly Ranchers. 
I was correcting their English papers. They should be here, but they're not here. They're not here because their lives are cut short by gun violence. So I have been teaching in the city of Providence for quite some time. I taught adjudicated youth um, for 14 years. Um, kids that were suspended from the Providence Public School, I taught them for four years. It was during that time that I got to know some of these kids that are not, that are on my list, unfortunately, that are on my list. Um, I've also got to know shooters. It was during that, and I've had my own experience um, with gun violence, growing up in Kingston, Jamaica, um, losing my grand uncle, who was a cop, um, who was shot and killed, I was only 14 years old, when I saw his lifeless body on the ground. And I've lost too many friends to gun violence. And so this is very personal to me, and it's painful to me, and it's traumatic to me, because I've lost family, I've lost friends, I've lost students, I've lost neighbors. So why? And so when I think about gun violence, I think about the intersectionality of gun violence. I think about race and racism. I think about class. I think about the kinds of investment that the General Assembly wants to place in our community. I think about the investments to our schools, and I think about the investments to the community in general. But violence doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happened because of something. And it happens because of trauma. Trauma from poverty, seeing people that you know and love dead. And so the question is, then why are you sitting up here? How did you get to be where you are when you've overcome, when you've gone through so much and you've seen so many dead bodies on the ground? How did you get to be here? Well, I got to be here because people cared for me and people poured into me. And that's why I teach in the city of Providence. I teach because I want to pour into kids what people poured into me. I want to tell kids that when you are born in poverty, the script was already written for you at birth, but you don't have to own that script. You can rip it up like I did, and you can write your own story. You can, because I did. I wrote in 2017, I got elected in 2016, and one of the first bills that I introduced was a bill to examine gun violence and the trauma of kids who have one or more parent incarcerated. At that time, a lot of folks weren't talking about trauma or gun violence or any of that. But I knew because I lived it. I knew because I was talking to my students. I knew because they were hungry. I knew because they were poor and they came from generations of poverty. <coughs> I am not sitting here and saying because you're poor, you have to put up a gun pick up a gun. I'm not saying that. But I'm also saying it's a manifestation of being poor. It's a manifestation of being devalued and living in a black or brown or poor white body where people don't, or systems don't value you. So I wrote that trauma bill because I know that we have to look at trauma. We have to look at adverse childhood experiences, death resulting, homicide resulting. And that's why I wrote the bill. And um, unfortunately, um, this bill is sitting in Wright's office in Washington Street, and nothing has been done. And so I hope that this conversation can also elevate the issue that Wright's need to do its job, get the commission seated so that teachers who don't understand the issues of trauma or don't understand the issues of adverse child experiences, can get to learn. Because mm -hmm. I am sitting here today because people poured into me, and people told me that I should dream the big dream. 
and at 17 I could go to college. We, our kids need us, yeah. and that's why I am here, and I'm here as a testimony. I am here to say it is possible. It is possible when we connect the dots, when we recognize that all children are valued and they're loved and they need to be cared for. You know, you just touched on something, talking about the grind up at the slow grind up at this state hub, the slow grind in, in our state departments, which is going to bring me to our last panelist, uh, Sydney Monstrine Cross. Um, but she's the chairwoman of the Rhode Island Coalition Against Gun Violence. And your cousin Johnny was murdered in 1998. And you told me that his memory is what drives you to work now. Um, but what does that look like when you were up at the State House? What is it taking to pass safer gun laws? Well, passing safer gun laws, as many of us know in this room, is a very long, drawn out process. And many of us have been involved in this for over a decade. And if you had told me a decade ago that we would <coughs> pass things such as an assault weapons ban, I would have been, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, I had no appreciation of how long that process is. Um, what I will say, and I'm very proud of, there are many of us in this room, we have amazing partner organizations with the Nonviolence Institute, Every Town, at Moms Demand Action, and, and many others, that we are collaborating and building a pipeline to pass these bills. <coughs> Part of that pipeline um, includes helping uh, elect people who are champions of gun violence prevention. The State House was a lot different uh, 10 years ago than it is now, and we have many, many champions in that State House who are fighting for gun violence prevention. So, for example, in the most recent election, we have 68 candidates who we endorsed who won their races, including Jennifer Boylan here. <laughs> And, but so in all of those 68 candidates, 60 of those are in the General Assembly. So we have a majority in both chambers. Um, and that's enormous because we need the legislators out there fighting for this issue and not cowering away from it. Um, so we've seen a lot of change up there and that is not only with elections but it's building relationships with legislators um, and also, I think over time they recognize it is what their constituents want. And the Boston Globe published a poll, I think in June this year, that said almost two thirds of Rhode Islanders um, are in favor of an assault weapons ban. Well, that's, those are people all over Rhode Island. Those are these elected officials' constituents. And I think they are listening um, and recognizing, for example, this year that many people running for office came to Rhode Island Coalition Against Gun Violence for our endorsement. They're recognizing that that's actually a benefit now. It's not a hindrance to their campaigns. And that that's a badge of honor to be endorsed by uh, an organization that's push push pushing for gun violence prevention. Mm -hmm. So now that we've heard from um, all of our panelists, I'm going to uh, voice some general questions at you that I'd like you to jump in on. Uh, one of them, actually, you just uh, spoke about uh, assault rifles, and it seems like every year there's an attempt to ban assault rifles, but much of the shootings and suicides are actually involving handguns. So should the people who really care about this issue, should there be a switch in focus? I mean, do you want to answer that question, or Sergeant McGann, you see a lot of guns that are being pulled out the street. Should there be more focus on handguns as opposed to assault rifles? I think assault rifles are get a lot of publicity, but what we see on a daily basis is this handgun rifle. Um, the assault rifles certainly, I, mean, I, I don't understand people's infatuation with that, I honestly don't, I, it's not, I mean, I was in the Army, I, I had to carry a weapon, but I, I never was, you know, really, it wasn't a thing to me. I think that there's a certain segment of the population that for whatever reason, you know, wants that assault rifle, but 
it gets, I, I would say, it gets a lot of the attention, but in reality, the, the real violence that we're seeing, and I'm not, if, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have an opinion on the assault rifle as well, but this, if we want to ban it, but the, what we should really need to be focused on is the handgun, because the handgun itself, I think the assault rifle is, is, is a lot of times associated with these mass shootings, mm -hmm. and they, they are hugely traumatic events. Um, but just from a purely tactical sense, the, the, the people that commit these acts don't need an assault rifle to do them. You know, they do close range, and um, the assault rifle really is a law enforcement. That's typically before you know, the last couple of years, these people with assault rifles are preparing themselves to encounter law enforcement. The, it was, it, the, that's only really remember the, 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 say the, the Miami shootout in 1987. Yeah. That, was a, that was a big event. Um, there was the, the LA shootout in 97. Those are big big events in, in law enforcement history. Um, but really, the, the, what we see the most of is, is handgun violence. And, and handguns are particularly dangerous because they're, they're pretty concealed. And you, yeah. can't, you, 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 don't, you don't know if someone has, if someone has a sword rifle and walk around, they're pretty identifiable, right. you know, so you can, you can kind of, there's a, there's a, at least a little bit of warning, there's a, a handgun there, isn't it? Yeah. I do think that, like I said, I think that the, what we see the most of is handgun violence. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, I teach, I teach high school in Providence, and I'm all about prevention, and schools are sacred places for teaching and learning. And we have seen nationally what high-powered rifles have done. And so we've got to prevent this stuff. We cannot wait for it to happen. We cannot be in our, I cannot be in my classroom and teachers all across the state and be worried if we're going to have a long-range rifle coming in that classroom. So I heard what the office said, I heard what you just said, but I also think that we should never wait until it hits our door. We ought to prevent this stuff. And I am all for banning this stuff because it has no place in Rhode Island and has no place in society. And I am literally afraid sometimes that it may hit our door. We've got to prevent that. I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing that I would like to prevent all these. Yeah. My, my point was just that the, the same effect can be accomplished with a handgun, in, in a, in a, particularly in a small, even in a small environment like a classroom. You know, uh, people forget about Virgin, before Las Vegas, the biggest mass shooting was Virginia Tech. And that guy had a Glock 19. And he, had, he had a Glock 19 and a 22. Las Vegas was the, 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 the person who was shooting into the, the concert. But the, you can, like I said, the assault, I have no affinity towards assault, assault rifles. That, that is, a, that, that is a more, much more of a dangerous situation for, 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 people, for law enforcement because of the range factor. But in a classroom, it's not a range situation. Close up. So I, I think that, like I said, assault rifles do get a lot of attention, but we, we, I don't want people to lose sight of it's the handguns that's doing the most damage. Yeah. Sydney, did you want to say something? Sure. I, uh, the great thing um, with an issue like this is that there's a lot of data out there, and we do study the data and research the science, and we recognize that states. Um, that have stronger gun laws have less gun violence. And when we talk about gun violence, we're not only talking about homicides and unintentional shootings, but we're talking about suicides. And so we recognize also when the, there was a federal ban on assault weapons, there was less gun violence. So we look at this as a very critical bill. 
we also do talk to our partner organizations, not only locally, but also on the national level, and look at what bills are passing around the country, too, and that are passing successfully to say, okay, you know, what, what is something that we can fight for that actually may pass successfully and that isn't being pushed back in other states? So there's a lot of research and background that goes into it, but certainly, I will say this is our number one bill, and it has been for a long time, and we will continue to push hard for it, and I know our partner organizations are with us on that as well. Sure, sure. Um, more people across the political spectrum have been purchasing guns, um, and the main reason, particularly during COVID, was uh, it was for their own protection, their family's protection. I remember talking to a store owner at the time who said, you know, people are protecting their toilet paper during COVID. Um, actually, at the beginning of the pandemic, Rhode Island, our blue state, uh, led the nation with the percentage of people getting background checks to buy guns. Um, what do you What do you make of this? What do you make of uh, we're, we're uh, concerned about gun violence, and yet people flocked to buy guns? Does anybody want to take that one? We probably the, 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 the newness and the, the, the scariness of the pandemic and how society was shut down and supply chains were shut down were felt that they were on their own and that they, that, that they were worried about civil society sort of breaking down a little bit and what their neighbors would do and how they felt that they would protect themselves. Like almost the, the prepper mentality, but maybe the prepper life because of the pandemic. Yeah. Did that, did that disappoint, disappoint any of you who work on you know, gun control issues to see this happen? Oh, absolutely. 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 <laughs> We're going to tell them about it. <laughs> you just feel like, people, what's going on? <laughs> right, right. I also feel that a lot of it had to do with um, individuals feeling like their Second Amendment rights were being taken away. Um, we have to understand that that um, is far from the truth. Uh, it is not about the Second Amendment rights. It is uh, using the proper um, procedures to protect our communities. Um, we are not trying to take guns away from anyone. We're just trying to make it um, safe and make our community safer. So. No, I'm just really <laughs> um, thinking about everything. People were worried. They were scared. Mental health is, you know, was like brought to bear during the, the pandemic. And um, but I really think one of the other reasons. I think, and you know, I, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who think that the, the, the surge in gun violence over the decades has to do with poverty and joblessness. I yeah, mean, that's a good point. Uh, do you think that we spend too much time talking about the weapons and not about the factors leading to the gun violence? I think we need to focus on what the, the root cause is. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid when I went to the General Assembly six years ago, there was not a lot of conversation that I was hearing yeah. about being poor or, or poverty and how those are drivers for gun violence. And I think if it's worthwhile for us to have conversations about solutions, like what do we need to do? And that is why one of the, the bills that I introduced and passed was the $50 living wage. To make sure that if people work hard, that they're able to keep the roof over their heads and they're able to send their kids to school. And let me just quickly say, $50 is not even up. <coughs> I signed on to legislation this past session to make it uh, $19 an hour. And in children, in fact, even that is not enough for the cost of rents and mortgages. And so we, we really need to focus on the solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of always like, thinking about the problem, the solution is get mental health services mm. that's accessible, that people can actually get to without having to call a million people to get to them. Right. You've got to make sure that we have jobs that, that's, that is attractive to young people. Yeah. That they will want to put the guns down and get to work. So we have to really get into the mindset of solutions. And I think we need to do more of that. And you know, Lisa, I want to bring you in on this as well because you are talking to the families who are directly affected by this gun violence. 
and you must see opportunities that if I can just get them into this, or if we can just, you know, <coughs> take away from that, ignore the gun violence, ignore the feud, what do you think would be some solutions? I mean, obviously, um, employment opportunities, trainings, education, um, absolutely everyone wants to be able to take care of their families. So, especially if we're talking about a young person who ends up getting um, a record and now they're, you know, we always say we want to get them to a certain age, right? At a certain age when it's almost like a light bulb comes on, right? Um, but some of our kids don't make it to that age. And unfortunately, sometimes prison is what allows our kids to get to that age. But if we had the opportunities before they got to that place, even for the, the families, um, there's so many resources that the families need. You know, housing, housing, housing is such a crisis, I mean, for all of us right now, for so many. Um, you know, food, you know, even with food stamps, people aren't, aren't able to really feed their, their families. You know, so there are so many resources, like, you know, we're, we're mentioning here, there, there's root causes of reasons and why are young people get involved in the lifestyle. Um, but definitely education and employment. Linda, also I'd like to say that we have to um, find a way. Uh, right now we're working with an organization called One Gun Born. Um, we have uh, 10 young men where um, we're teaching them trades. But um, in that process, we're also speaking to them um, in, in reference to violence. So I think if we bring back um, simple values, um, as I speak of all the time, um, it takes a village to raise our children. So we have to regroup and bring that village back together, um, provide these preventative uh, resources to our children so that um, we can take them back from the streets because the streets is what actually um, has our children and um, is what has provided a lot of this violence to occur. Great point, great point. So I could just add to that, Diana, also, we also know that hurt people hurt people. So finding out where the hurt is coming from and how to heal. Because many people in our community culturally, they don't know how to heal. They know how to heal by responding to the violence. Yeah. You know, instead of responding to the hurt and the emotions that they're feeling. What do you see as the ripple effect when there is someone in the community who has been either shot or killed? What, how is that amplified? Um, One is fear. You know, I've, I've heard mothers, grandmothers say, I'm afraid, um, you know, one child was shot, my other child is going to go retaliate. Um, so there's definitely fear, there's anger. There's, you know, grief comes in many forms, you know, and lots of times in our young men we see definitely the anger when they want to retaliate. Um, but the ripple effect, it affects everyone. They could, you know, when you live on a, in a neighborhood, something could happen um, a street over. But when you're a child and you hear, when you get on your school bus and everyone on the school bus is talking about Jojo from down the street that was shot and he was laying in the street and he was bleeding, yeah. every kid is now traumatized. They have to live with that, and that's a fear, you know. So there is definitely a ripple effect. It, it affects everyone in our community. It might not impact that person directly, but just knowing that someone's life was taken in any way affects everyone. Yeah, yeah. And that gets to your bill, actually, your legislation, Marcia, as a teacher, training teachers to recognize and understand adverse childhood experiences. Yeah. You know, um, I think this bill is so, so important. Um, you know, a lot of time, and, and teachers really want to teach. You know, that's what we signed up for. We want to teach math, science, whatever. But we really need to cue in on what kids are going through. And whether it be knowing someone, as, as um, Lisa said, a family member, a friend who died, right? So teachers need to recognize it our children are knowing people, and by the way, gun violence is not, does not peak zip codes, right? This is a national crisis. And so teachers need to recognize what kids are going through and to check in with them. How are you doing? Um, it's one of the reasons also I introduced my bill um, to ensure that kids are fed. And it doesn't matter where in the state that you live if you show up, um, in the school cafeteria, you should get a hot lunch um, because 
trauma is caused by hunger too. So it's a lot there that this bill will address and I uh, am so grateful. But having teachers be informed, and we haven't even really talked about secondary trauma. <coughs> the trauma that teachers and caregivers face when they know of or hear of kids losing their family. And we haven't absorbed that conversation yeah. or have that child do whatever we do to comfort that child. So we haven't even discussed secondary trauma in the conversations that we're having. But these are like real things. And um, I cannot wait for the day when we can have conversations about kids living and not dying. But I'm not naive to think that it's gonna be wished away by a magic wand. This is gonna take hard work and it's gonna take conversations that are honest and open. And it's gonna take conversations, it's gonna make all of us uncomfortable. Because we have to talk about these things because these things are real. But I'm really excited about the fact that we're able to pass that legislation and really anxious to see it implemented with teachers who may not have been exposed in their lives to gun violence, may not have been exposed to poverty, may not have been exposed to suicide or whatever. Um, they get a chance to learn how to respond, not just to say I'm trauma-informed, but to really know what am I looking for mm -hmm. and how do I attend to this child with kindness and with love and with caring and with compassion. And I think that is what this bill, my intent for this bill was, to really center children, especially the children who need our love the most. You know, I think it's so interesting in, in having these conversations here and talking about solutions. Well, what we're not hearing are the things that we normally hear, or, or journalists normally hear after a terrible tragedy as politicians come out and say, what we really need um, are more, more cops. What we really need is more of this, more of that. And, and they don't talk about mental health necessarily. They don't talk about housing. They don't talk about investments in education. You think the conversation has been just totally wrong this whole time when we talk about solving gun violence? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Audience is like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> you want to say something about yeah. I think, like any deep seated problem, they're so multifaceted. I mean, we look at it and it's a very Problem. We all know that. Obviously, root causes are very deep, and there's a lot of trauma for sure. Um, and thankfully, I think we are all coming at these from from different directions. But I think, like solving, or I don't remember what I solving, like preventing gun violence takes a village of all of us coming at it from different angles. Um, you know, and so I think every organization who's working on these types of issues is helping in that regard, or whether it's education or mental health, um, you know, the work that we do, which is policy related, I do think it's just got to come from so many different angles, um, because certainly none of us are going to, to change it by working in a silo. Um, I mean, the collaboration that we have in this small state helps all of us in so many ways move things forward in a positive way. Um, and I think we, in, in thinking about gun violence, it's a public health epidemic. Um, and there are many, many, many pieces of the puzzle that need to come together to help decrease um, the, the trauma, the morbidity, the, the mortality. Um, and we all work on a piece of that, but I think they, all of those do overlap, thankfully. I just uh, want to add something, Amanda, because you, you said something when something happens, something awful happens, everyone comes up and says, especially politicians, what do we need, what do we need to do? But that's just it. It shouldn't be when it happens. It should be all the time. This is a conversation that we can't stop. It has to continue, and as Sydney said, um, I only have lived in Rhode Island, so I can only say for Rhode Island, we have this thing about silos. Um, you know, everyone was in silos, you know, when no one's, Coming together, so I think it's it's now the time for the collaborations and the figuring out how do we do this together. And I am seeing more of that, and that's that is definitely refreshing to see. You know, organizations, um, different systems coming together, figuring what can we do differently? How can we do this together? 
So how do you bring in, when we're talking about different uh, people, how do you bring in the gun rights supporters who are very nervous about losing their rights to firearms for whatever reason? I know that's a really hard conversation to have. We've seen the fights at the State House every single session, but you know we all have people who, who disagree you know, in our own lives. How would you recommend having that conversation with someone who is a gun owner and is really concerned about any new legislation, any changes coming down? Not, yeah. not even to legislation, but how do we talk about gun violence when people don't necessarily agree? First, I want to say they probably need nonviolence training. So they can't say that nonviolence is just that. I do think, I mean, for those of us who've been in the State House, those are really challenging days um, to be there and, and very difficult, but we also know we need to be there. Um, I think there are opportunities sometimes to have those conversations in that setting, and sometimes we also know it's better not to engage because they certainly aren't going to convince me that everybody should have guns, and I'm certainly not going to convince them that, oh, this should be banned. Um, but we do find that there is some common ground, but it's difficult for sure because it is a really polarizing issue. What we have to remember all the time, though, is like in the poll that the Boston Globe did and in a poll that the Rhode Island Coalition Against Gun Violence did about four years ago, the majority of Rhode Islanders by far are concerned about gun violence and, and support gun violence prevention bills. Um, you know, at that time we were looking not only at assault weapons and high capacity magazine bans, we were looking at the domestic violence bill. So we need to remember that although people can be loud about their wishes, we need to remember that the majority of Rhode Islanders support stronger gun laws. They support decreasing gun violence. Um, and so we always need to remember that that's who the majority are. We need to remind um, the people in the State House that um, those numbers, not everybody's at the State House on those nights, but that just because people are loud doesn't mean that they represent the majority or that they even live in this state. <laughs>
we started really thinking about the layer, the, the community, and even a lot of the people that are closest to the violence want nothing to do with the violence. Everybody wants to live this Everybody wants to be safe. There are, there are, there are kids, I know we've talked about trauma, I, I believe this. I think there are kids in these neighborhoods that have as much PTSD as combat veterans. Because they're just dealing with shootings and dealing with violence and they're dealing with stuff that is not, um, you know, not talked about. But there's mo most of the people, they want nothing to do with this. There's a sliver, a small group of people that are the center of the violence. They're the, the, the shooters and they're the targets. But what happens is, is people around them get drawn in, injured, all the rest of these things. So it, it, if you can be more precise, you can, you can sort of pick out the, what we would call them the live wires, the, the people that are in the middle of everything. That also, if you can do that, it doesn't the community itself? If you if you come in with a like, with a big hammer, the community reacts that way because everybody's affected by it. You know, if it, if everyone's getting stopped, and everybody, everybody's it's, so the community's like, well, I don't want to deal with the cops. If they stop me, they stop my brother. This and that. If we can be smarter about it, that will long term build a little bit more trust. In this, at some point, the community, like in this, we've, we've, everyone has said this here, it takes a village, but that, that village has got to be on the side of us, at some, on the side of law enforcement, where it, it, this tit for tat stuff, if we can interject in there, something happens if we can make an arrest. It takes the pressure off of everybody, it takes the pressure off of the neighborhood say we have to do something. Now if we can therefore in, over time maybe build some trust back in here where we have the credibility where we can we can get a little more early warning, we can get a little better intelligence. Um, like I said, we just have to we have to keep working to get better at our job. And you know, uh, Colonel Esselman when he came 20, 20 years ago, one of the things he said that shocked a lot of people was he said I, I, I would rather have I, I would I wish I had an incompetent homicide division. You know I wish I, I wish I was my my homicide was over two instead of with an 80% clearance rate on 10 homicides. But because Explain why. there's eight less bodies, there's eight less you know homicide victims. He he would much rather his thought process was to be ahead of it. Um, Prevent instead of arrest. For, right, so don't, don't make arrests. It never happens. And, and that's a tough thing to quantify because the stuff that this, a lot of stuff that we do, if something doesn't happen, it's kind of out there. You know, when, you know you, 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 it's tough to say this action prevented this action. We don't know. Um, we, we think it does, but we, 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 like I said, we, we just have to be. I, I think we need to think differently about how we approach what we do. Being strategic and proactive. Yeah, sure. I, I, I want to just speak back on what you said, because um, I believe, I do believe that we need police. Uh, there's a place for police in our, in our communities. But I also believe that it is not okay when a young man 18 to 21 or 25, who is going about their business, going to the basketball, and a cop pulls this kid over, pushed him against the whatever there is. That is not how you build relationship. You really build relationship when you have conversations and you talk to people and you do not believe that every black or brown or poor white kid walking in South Providence or walking in the Western area is a potential bad person. And so you approach them, right, by pushing them against the vehicle. And I've seen this, by the way. I've seen this with my own two eyes. 
And so I think there's a lot there, but we need to have these conversations where, and I support police, um, community policing, by the way. I support police going to the basketball um, court and learning the kids' name, knowing who they are. That is how we, we, we're gonna solve this thing. We're not gonna solve it when it's them against us. It doesn't work that way. And so I, I, I can tell you, I am really, really anxious for the day to come when kids that are walking, going about their own business, is not just right in front of their mom or their auntie. And you're just standing there and I've seen this. I've actually seen this. And, and it's, it's not just, it's, you don't build communities that way. I know I'm saying the same thing over. <coughs> Again, repetition means learning. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm, I'm really anxious because we've got to solve the issue of gun violence. And it's generational, and it's hurtful, and it's painful. Like we're knowing families, it's cyclical, and it's hard. So what you, what you speak of is sort of the same thing that I, I agree with you. Those, those uh, credibility factors and the, the irony is the, the, you know, the public polling. The, the people that need us the most have the lowest opinion of us. But people that need us probably the least, you know, su su suburbial, the, the, these, these areas that are not as affected by gun crime, they probably have the highest opinion of us. So there's this inverse relationship of that, you know, um, these are, and these, like I said, these are, these are gonna be tough problems to unwind because if, if we, we feel we have a, how we operate, a lot of times in, in, in common, but people, it, so it, there has to be a little bit of, you know, if there's relationships, and it's this understanding, and, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not justifying it if somebody it acts inappropriately. I'm just saying, as we go along, if we can build that credibility aspect of it, is in my mind, the, because that will change the dynamic. People will be more, it will just, you, you won't have these situations where we're trying to work on something and, and you know, the, the line you'll get all the time is, well, just do your job. So that, that, that's cold word for, listen, I, I really wish you could make this stop, but I can't help you. Because if I were to help you, it's just that you're not that accepted in the neighborhood. So we can we just, there's got to be a way, it's going to take time. The non-violence has done a great, a lot of work for helping us in, in that in that way, um, but there's a lot of work to be done. And those are the that's part of why these, these these things go on is that dysfunctional friction that is just there. Yeah, it's complex. Do we? Is it time for questions? Okay, <laughs> we could go on up here, but I'm sure some of you have some questions. <coughs> and Valerie has a microphone. Yeah, sure. Before we get started, can I just say that the chorus or choral um, performers and chamber singers, you are amazing. Um, yeah. Older. 
Um, so that is part of my job. I see, I work with a lot of people that have trauma, that have experienced trauma as child children. And um, I just wanna, prevention is something that I am big on. Uh, because once it happens, it's happened. And um, I really, when I was going to grad school in St. Louis, Missouri, um, I did an internship at an elementary school that had wraparound services. Everything was located in this elementary school. There was mental health, um, mental health opportunities. There was um, obviously education. There was recreational stuff. I mean, I don't see Rhode Island doing a lot of wraparound services, um, and I think that's what we need. We need to not be so fragmented in our state. We need to come together and have wraparound services in a public elementary school or some kind of school. It should be a community um, partnership in a community building, which makes sense to be a school. So I mean, that is my idea as a social worker who has been in this field for over 25 years and worked with very vulnerable clients. Um, and I see the devastation that violence has impacted on the clients that I serve. And I really hope that I was elected so I could address this issue as an elected official um, because there's so many ideas that I have to help clients that I, I work with. And um, one of them is investing in wraparound services and um, a community approach to gun violence. changes over time. 
you know, you become a better person. Cynicism, cynicism and cynic, being cynical <coughs> is, a, is an issue in, in law enforcement. How do you predict for that? I don't know. I don't, I don't know how you, I don't know what you, you know, they, they were going to be smarter people than me that can make those analysis. Marcia, do you think if the children were raised in your community to become police officers, judges, or lawyers, that they would be better respected? So I think it goes both ways, right? I think if kids are given love, I think if kids are given respect, I think if adults, police officers, anyone, get to have conversations with children and become role models and mentors and talk to them. I always say, you know, to teachers, you know, I mean, I have four kids of my own and I try to teach my kids and respond to my students the same way that I respond to my own kids. So I would say to police officers, if, and I am not qualified to talk to police officers, um, I would say to them, when you meet a black or brown or poor white person or any person, especially children, especially the ones in their formative years, be kind to them. Be kind. Get to know them, not in a judgmental way. Get to talk to them. Be a mentor, because mentoring works. Go visit them at school. The first reaction in, in, for a lot of kids with, with officers are adversarial. That sets up a really bad situation right there. So my idea is get to know kids as they are and just be kind to them. Like not judge them. Not see them as having somebody who's in jail or somebody who killed somebody or not stereotyping kids based on their race, their gender, their ethnic background, their socioeconomic status. Just see them like your own kids. That's what I try to do every day in my practice as a teacher. I don't pretend that I'm perfect, but I really try to be kind, and I really try to be loving. And I think if police officers try that, just try to be kind, try to listen, try to be non-judgmental, then I think we could have some police officers in the fifth grade and the sixth grade. So that would be my, my take. Maybe you could say something. Yeah, please. Um, I have a sort of a different perspective um, with that question, uh, Barbara. Um, I do feel like officers should be of the community. Um, being someone who was born and raised in Providence and living in a community where um, a lot of the violence is occurring, um, I feel like if you are from outside of the community and you don't have that perspective or you don't know what is going on with the community, you can't relate with these children. Um, yes, we do have wonderful individuals on the police force who do not live in um, these areas. But once again, as I said, um, in order to meet the child, uh, with their needs or to know what is going on, I do feel that you should be of the community. More questions? Okay. Hello. Hello. Right from early childhood is one of the most important 
uh, and obviously from now, but we want to prevent. We're talking about prevention. So how are you connecting with these communities to really talk about how we can um, prevent a lot of these issues from happening? Or even invest, how are we investing in after school programs? I am the program manager at In Voices, and one of the biggest you know, places where we can bring in youth where they have a safe space to come to, where they have opportunities to not only you know, have a safe space, but we advocate, we're at the state house advocating for bills as well. And actually, where, where are we investing money into prevention programs that are actually going to help you know, our community, our youth, um, our little ones as well, and really at that prevention piece. So how are you um, really looking at the whole scope, right? Because we're talking about poverty, homelessness. These are at the root of a lot of these issues that are not being um, addressed. Right, and really looking at a trauma-informed state, right? Building those relationships, being able to have our police officers that are trained and trauma-informed that know how to really support and build those relationships with the whole community, with our young people, with the families, parents. So how have you had these conversations and how are you really taking those next steps to do this? And I hope I have a youth here that I also have a question. We should vote for the people who share our values. Yeah. 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 And um, another uh, response is, um, I'd like to echo what the uh, woman said as far as her running. Um, I also run ran for um, House District Five. Um, I wanted to uh, implement the wraparound services that she spoke about because I am in the community um, as an advocate, and we do not have those services. Um, We've addressed that with a lot of the um, city councilors, um, other advocates in the community, and as of right now, uh, we're, we're lacking that um, really bad. So, you know, the only thing that I can say is to continue to ad advocate um, as you're doing right now, and um, bring it to our, our uh, elected officials who are in office now and, and continue with it. And I wanted to add to the wraparound service. I want to say. In, in my school, and we're looking to replicate this all across the state, we have, because we know that hunger is a big issue, so we have a full food pantry at Visa Street Elementary School um, where kids can get the meals. We also have in my school, we have a hygiene um, pantry where kids can get, whether it be toothbrushes or underarm or whatever. And we're trying to replicate having a full pantry in every single school in Rhode Island. Because we know that when you're hungry, you can't learn. We also know that hunger and poverty are traumatic events as well. So yes, 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 we need to have wraparound service right in our schools. Because kids are gonna spend most, most of their waking hours anyway in a school, and yes, 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 we need more, not less. But again, you got to vote for people that share our values. Is a young person who, yeah, right there? No, and I just wanted to add that, like, I was a case manager as well for a full service school where we did a lot of wraparound work. The families got to really write, have all of those services within the school, and you saw those changes because of that. They were able to have that wraparound support. We have to have a more wraparound community, a wraparound state, where we have to really interconnect, right? Have those, that warm transfer, where we're not like, it's not just like the police officers and the, the police department has those connections with community partners and are building relationships with the community partners. Um, and the community, I think that's very important. Uh, thank you for all you do. I love what you said about a trauma-informed state. That's exactly what we need. Everyone needs to be trauma-informed. Okay, hi everybody, my name is Julie. Um, I wrote my question down so I can have like all my thoughts. Um, so throughout the night, I've heard a lot of talk about um, prevention. A great way to prevent school, um, shootings is for schools having more counselors, more social workers, more social and emotional supports for students rather than SROs. 
Um, what ways do you see um, that being implemented? Because 14 million students are in school with police, but no counselors, no nurses, no psychiatrists, no social workers.
um, strong debate um, on either side, and it's just, I feel like we're constantly butting heads and there's no like give, you know what I mean? Um, and yeah, um, would you say that we just keep going one step at a time, like taking, you know, making laws and everything? Like, I don't know, what would you guys say? Um, I would just like to say, um, as a mother who has um, experienced gun violence by the youth of my daughter Essence, um, my hope came from within. It came from, um, unfortunately, the loss of Essence. Um, and then experiencing uh, so much crime that, that has been um, taken within our community. Um, yeah, you just have to continue to, to fight and um, echo the voices. Um, you know, being in the presence of um, other mothers like Maya and um, many others that unfortunately I had, I had to be in the presence of, um, that gives me that, that um, upliftment to continue to, to want to thrive and make sure that we make change. I also know, um, for example, with, with, the, with the work that we do, um, I am afraid if we were not here collectively, you know, trying to pass stronger gun laws. We know every year there are laws that are, that are, people are trying to pass that will weaken our gun laws. So like for me and the work that I do, and I know again, a lot of people in this room, if we recognize that we must keep pushing. And we did, like this year, we passed three really strong bills, and that gives us hope and momentum. But we recognize that we can't be like, oh yeah, and that we're done, um, because we do know our opposition is strong. So that also keeps you like, yeah, we, we have a mission here to keep working on this and keep moving forward. And sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back. Um, and sometimes, like this year, we had three steps forward, and, and that was terrific. So you just have to gain strength from those situations. And um, like Diana said, in my own situation, um, sometimes <coughs> your own trauma drives you to, to recognize that you don't want that to happen to anybody. And so it just is this internal flame that keeps, keeps you going. Um, but I think everybody needs to find that what 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 is it that keeps them going and driving toward something of hope, and that's going to be different. Maybe for you, it's singing, <laughs> and you should keep at that and that. You know, whatever it is that keeps your your drive, it's going to be different for everybody. But you you, you find that, and it, it will be your motivator. And thank you. That's such a beautiful question. So glad you asked it. For me, it's my faith, my faith in God, my faith um, in humanity. I firmly believe that people are inherited, inherently good. I really and truly believe so. But what happens in our lives that makes that shift? And I think, you know, if we can tap into the goodness in all of us, tap into something that's bigger than all of us, something that's more purposeful. But for me, it's just, I've got to keep going because the alternative is to hide under a rock. I can't do that. I've got to do it for the kids that we've lost. I have got to do it for the families that I've lost. And I've got to do it for the students that I look in their eyes every single day. Because I see hope in their lives. I see hope in their eyes, and it just keeps me going. I can't stop. I don't have a choice. I think President Obama said that the bar of justice is, is long but uneven. Um, these times, each time, it might feel that this is the worst time. But if you look back historically, every generation has to deal with something. Each generation dealt with World War II. Civil War generation dealt with, you know, that. Um, we've had civil rights. We've had, you know, we've had the Great Depression. 
Life is about sort of, life isn't really supposed to be easy. There's supposed to be challenges. That's how you get invigorated. That's how you become stronger. That's the, if there are no challenges, where, where, is, where, where is the struggle? You know, you know, every, you, you're, you're not, we're not really built to, to do nothing. You're, you're, you're built to have a belief. You're, you're built to strive for something, either individually or if it's, it's collectively. Um, I can tell you, uh, being, a, being a police officer can sometimes be a thankless job, but I take pride in that. I take pride in, in, in coming to work and, and serving the public. I don't, I don't need anybody's, you know, I, I, it's, that's a self-motivating thing. I, I want to be of service, and that's what drives me. I could, I could get another job, I could go do something else. I want to do this. So, I guess, you know, thinking about that, embrace that struggle. Don't run away from it. Embrace it. Um, I would just add that for me, um, it's definitely my faith and just being grateful that I have, um, you know, it, it seems kind of sad to say, but I feel like I'm honored to be with a mom when she's told that her child isn't going to make it. I'm honored to be with a family when they're um, honoring their loved one on a memorial. I'm honored to have those moments, and I'm grateful that God gives me the ability to do that. Um, a lot of people ask me how. Even my mother asks me, why do I continue to do this work? And I truly believe that God gives me the ability to do it, so I'm grateful. On that note, thank you so much for being an amazing audience tonight. Thank you for
everyone who is here tonight for coming out on a kind of cold day after all the warm days, a uh, chilly day, to talk about this topic. Um, I wish I weren't standing here tonight. <laughs> I shouldn't have to be. Uh, like so many of us, I had long been concerned about gun violence in our communities and our nation. But gun violence was, of course, something that happened to other people. And then at 7 a.m. Sunday, August 1st, 2021, the Providence Police came to our door to tell us that our 24-year-old daughter, Maya, had been the victim of a drive-by shooting on the east side of Providence. And I could not believe it. I couldn't fathom it. I didn't get it. It made no sense then, it makes no sense now. In the 15 months since her death, a close friend had a colleague in Chicago who lost her high school age son to a person with a gun, and then just last week, another close friend's grandson was at his high school in Seattle when a 14-year-old pulled out a gun and killed a classmate. And of course, we did learn about you know this most recent mass shooting at a school at the University of Virginia. I'm sure some of you here know friends of friends who have lost loved ones to gun violence. Um, obviously, we saw that. And sadly, I know I'm not the only one who's lost a child, who's in this auditorium who's lost a child, uh, because our nation has a serious gun problem. My question is, how many of us have to lose our children before something changes? How many children have to die? After Maya died, I did not want to talk about guns. I understood how impossible it was to have a rational discussion about them. I couldn't handle more conflict or negativity. Instead, I chose to focus on my head. <laughs> a forward-thinking colleague created a GoFundMe campaign that I called Maya's Voice. After all, Maya was a speech-language pathologist. She had just got her master's and just started her job three weeks before she was killed. So Maya's Voice is a fitting name for a speech pathologist. We decided to use any money raised to create a scholarship for a student who would go on to study communicative disorders, as Maya had done. The generosity of our colleagues, our friends, our family, our community, and complete strangers floored us. We had hoped to raise enough funds for a one-time scholarship, and instead we raised enough to create two memorial scholarships in Maya's name at the Rhode Island Foundation. On the one-year anniversary of her death, we announced the inaugural scholarship winners, a student from Rick and a student from URI, and in perpetuity, that's where those scholarships will go, to a student from Rick and a student from URI studying communicative disorders. We continue to raise money for the scholarship fund with the goal of increasing the amount of the awards. We also created a nonprofit, Maya's Voice, which recently received tax-exempt status. We had a hard time coming up with a concise mission statement. I probably needed some professional help for that, but Maya's Voice is all about encouraging young people to consider careers in communicative disorders and related fields. And it's only because we had a good friend who was an SLP that Maya even thought about being an SLP and really got into it. Um, we also, this, this nonprofit, we want it to help students find, or young people find their, uh, find and use their voices to support their values and benefit their communities, to create awareness about the impact of violence in our communities, and to promote the values that Maya believed in, diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, the power of education, and love of community, and just plain love. There she is with her rat. She's <laughs> you see, Maya loved many things, including Harry Potter, baseball, pizza, tattoos, animals, reality TV, Legos, her profession, her family, and her friends, just to name a few things she loved. She was a beautiful, loving, hardworking, kind, sentimental, empathetic, brilliant, goofy, caring person. And I think if you ask anyone who knew her, they will tell you that she would go out of her way to help a friend. But just like that, a person with a gun, in fact, as I learned in the media, a ghost gun took her from us. You know, I had heard about ghost guns, but I didn't really understand what they were. I thought people made them with 3D printers and sold them on the black market. And then after I learned that a polymer 80 was used to kill Maya, that's what I saw on the news at least, I looked it up. I was shocked when I realized there is a legitimate company called Polymer 80 that sells gun kits. Their motto is AFT, assemble for thyself. And you can buy t-shirts that proudly proclaim this. My question is why? Why is it possible for anyone to go online and purchase, and purchase a kit 
And I, based on reading the FAQs, they don't keep any kind of credit card information. It's all very, you know, nobody's gonna know. It seems to me, even those of us who are Second Amendment purists might have some concern about these untraceable guns. To me, banning the sale of ghost guns, ghost guns nationwide, I know we've done it in Rose, Rhode Island, but nationwide is the kind of sensible gun control a lot of us can get on board with. At least, I hope so. As much as I didn't want to talk about guns, I know I have to. Yes, people kill people, but guns make it a whole lot easier. And if, and I think about it, you know, after all, Maya would not have been killed in a drug, drug by stabbing. There are certainly important groups out there and represented here tonight that are working to reduce senseless gun violence. Whether or not you're ready to join the movement, there are things that you can do now to make a difference. We need to stop hating and fearing each other. Hate, fear, anger, revenge, they must be countered with kindness, acceptance, empathy, and love. And along with this, as a community, as a society, we must care for all of our children. They deserve that. So thank you again for coming, for helping in the fight against gun violence, for promoting the values of communication and love, and most of all, for modeling the supportive community.